Good morning, folks. This is April 2nd, 2024. This is the Podman community meeting. Um, in this meeting, we generally do demos of interest for things related to the Podman generally, but oftentimes builders, Scopio, and other container projects as well. So we're always happy to take any kind of discussion topics that you may have for the future. Please let me know. We have meeting notes inside of uh, HackMD, which you can go ahead and update at any point in time that you want to go ahead and add a topic. Although I do appreciate being let, having uh, noticed to me also. And so for today, we have a number of topics. We have deploying LLMs with Podman and Kubernetes with Stefan Roker. And Stefan, am I messing up your name? I am misspelling it at least, I see. No, it's fine. No. <laughs> That's good. Okay. And then um, not only will be talking about Podman manifest supports for artifacts. Then Tim will be talking about doing a quick Podman desktop update demo for us, especially on the areas that are newish. Matt's going to be talking about 501 updates, and then we'll have room for um, any miscellaneous topics that people would like to see. And then just as a quick reminder, our next meeting will be on Tuesday, June 4th. And then a quick note from our sponsor. Urbashi, do you want to talk through this, or do you want me to? Uh, sure. Are you sharing your slides, Stone? Because I don't see anything. Oh, dear. That was not very good. Try that. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so just um, a quick announcement that DevConf US is a free open source conference that Red Hat sponsors in the Boston area. It happens at Boston University. Um, so we're back in person this year in August. I should have put the dates on the slide, but it's August 14th to 16th. If you scan the QR code, it'll take you to our website. Um, the CFP is currently open till April 22nd, so we really encourage, um, you know, anyone in the open source community to please submit talks. We have a lot of interesting tracks and themes for this year. Uh, yep, that's it. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> no problem. No problem. All righty. We've All got, right. got to turn it over to Stefan and uh, talking about LLMs. Um, we can also, Tim, we can also switch. It's fine for my side. I'm, I'm sorry, I can barely hear you, Stefan. Yeah, sorry. I put a comment in. Uh, if, if possible, I'd like to go in the first half hour. Uh, oh, okay. And if you want to go first, Stefan. Oh, no, no. Tim, if, if you guys don't mind switching, we'll just go ahead and switch that up now. And we'll go with Tim first. OK. Um, so I uh, don't have any uh, big demo or uh, presentation to show. I just wanted to talk through um, uh, the Podman Desktop 1.8 release. Um, so this has been out for a few weeks now. Um, the uh, And I'm just going to kind of run through you know, what are the, the features and changes? Um, the first is by default, uh, it will install Podman 4.9.3. Um, you'll notice right off that I actually am running Podman 5. Um, it does work uh, with Podman 5, 5 uh, just fine. And I'll talk about that uh, more at the end. Um, so what have we added this release? Um, first is what we call global onboarding. Um, it basically means if you've never used Podman desktop before and you start it up, uh, after the welcome, we'll prompt you to install uh, Podman, uh, help create your first Podman uh, machine. We'll kind of walk you through that process and make sure that everything is uh, set up. Um, there is onboarding for uh, Podman itself, uh, uh, for Docker Compose using Podman. Um, and over time, we'll probably add uh, more things there. If you skip that, you can go to settings and uh, do it again later. Um, but we just wanted to make sure that when people do their first install, um, you know, they can get a, a working environment with everything uh, configured right off the bat. Um, the next thing is we've added a learning center here. Um, it's basically just a set of cards with, uh, you know, common things that people want to set up uh, using Kubernetes, um, you know, using uh, a Corcus, Spring Boot. Um, and you just click on these, it opens up the documentation page uh, for how to get started with those things. Um, uh, we've added a bunch of API improvements for extensions to do new things. I won't get uh, into the detail on that here. Um, there's a bunch of uh, minor things like when you do a build, 
uh, it will prompt you uh, for which platforms you want to build for. You can, uh, you know, uh, select that on the build page. Um, and the other uh, big thing is the support for uh, Kubernetes. So I have uh, Kind uh, running on Podman uh, right now, and we have this new section in the left here, support for deployments, services, and uh, ingresses and routes. So actually, let me delete that one. Um, so there's a, a bunch of related things, but uh, the, the first is that you can apply YAML. You can just pick uh, YAML. It does the same as kubectl apply. Um, you know, stands up those resources. Uh, you can see here that YAML had a bunch of deployments and services. I can now see them within Podman Desktop. Um, you can go to details for any of these. You know, the normal things that uh, that you'd want to do as a Kubernetes uh, developer. Um, there's also support for you know making changes to these. I won't uh, uh, apply now, but you know you can edit the YAML directly and apply it. Um, and uh, you know, delete anything uh, from here. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess first, any questions on on what I've shown? Okay. Yeah, uh, go ahead. I didn't see whose hand that was. Rahel, or is that just a thumbs up? I heard the tweet too, but I don't see anybody with a hand up. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, uh, I mean, that's it for the release. There's a blog post on PodmanDesktop.io that goes into a bit more detail and has uh, some screenshots. Um, and then I just wanted to talk about Podman Five for a minute. Um, there is a release of Podman Desktop uh, imminent, the one point nine release in the next couple of days. Um, the big change there will be if you don't have Podman installed on your machine, we'll offer to install Podman 5.0, not 4.9. Um, and then there's an experimental option uh, in the settings. If you turn that on, uh, we'll uh, uh, add a button to update from 4.9 to 5.0 if you have 4.9 on your system. And that'll go through a few things like making sure your machines are stopped, um, helping you with migration. Um, but that's experimental because we're not sure that we've kind of caught everything. And we don't want to go through the 4.9 to 5.0 uh, migration and, and you know, leave people in a bad state. Um, so again, we're doing more testing on that, trying to make sure we've got all the edge cases and we'll do you know, the next release. Uh, we'll uh, you know, default to 5.0 and promoting people to, to migrate from 4.9 to 5.0. And initial feedback we've been getting is uh, 5.0 solves a lot of problems. Performance, especially on Mac, uh, huge improvements. Um, so that's all I had. Uh, if there's any questions, speak up. Otherwise, oh, yep, yeah, I see a hand. It's not clapping. Oh, there was a clap. OK. Yep. Sorry. Um, which which I concur with. If you could, before you leave, could you um, drop a link to the blog post that you mentioned? Sure. And I'll go ahead and include that inside the notes. And thank you. Unless there's any other questions. OK, thanks. All right. Stefan, go ahead and take it away, talking about LLMs. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So let me, I'm actually logged in twice <laughs> with Mac and Linux. So let's see if that works. Um, yeah, so last year, yeah, my, my background is basically, I'm, I've been doing now machine learning since, since more than 10 years ago, Linux for 20 years. And uh, there's, as you all know, there's a lot of buzz about LLMs, but as you look deeper at the, the use software, everything, it's a pain to set up usually so i re-found my my love for containers <laughs> since it makes a lot of things easier and uh, since I'm, i i did it the hard way uh, last year uh, like five months ago i, I did a workshop at the uh, red hat developers hands-on day and the hard way for me was using just using Podman. in all the examples as you might know uh 
it's a bit tricky to get everything running, including GPU support. So um, on this URL on my GitHub, you can find the actual workshop, not the content itself. I think I still have to, to do that. But you can find all the instructions for deploying an LLM with Podman. So the the tool uh, I, I used, or the, the software library I used, is called Ulama. And some of you might know it, as there's actual Docker people working on that. So Ulama is basically the Docker, as they call themselves, Docker of machine learning models. And why is that the case? If you ever work with a model, you know you can download the, the weights from sites like Hugging Face. But uh, same as for programs, you need additional software and settings. Uh, I can show you one example. You can also upload them uh, to their to their website. It's basically like Podman or Docker Push. And then there's a few additional settings like a Docker file or container file. You have a model file. As you might know, the, these models, they have different parameters and template. I think this is very important that you get these kind of templates right if you work with this. So in the workshop, I've used it also because they out of the box supported Docker. But of course, all the explanations and how tools only wrote how you can do that with Docker. And with Putman, it was a bit different. So um, to, to show you what the end result is, the end result is basically a chatbot with uh, retrieval augmented generation. I think that many of you might have heard that. That's the, the bus at least uh, a few months ago. So nowadays, it's quite easy to do. There's enough software out of there. Uh, but how to do that with Podman? I think the most important thing uh, when you start something, you, you, you need to choose a, a, a image you can derive from. And uh, one common complaint I've heard from my customers and people I talk to, usually these, these software is not developed by software engineers, like people like myself with a different background. Uh, and they just take a large container of a popular distribution, right, and put in everything, then you have five or tens of gigabytes of things. So the first thing I did uh, is to create that container file um, or Docker file. That, that's one thing I was uh, very curious as the doc, <laughs> Docker file is the Docker file and didn't pick up the container file. Um, well, it, it does if you if you put it in the command line. So it's nothing. It's nothing fancy, right? You you take a universal build image, for example, from Red Hat, and then everything you do, you just install the needed packages. So I'm using Streamlit in that case and change the user, and expose a port. So I did this before I did my container uh, specialization. So that was the ultimate preparation, I would say, as I learned a lot of things how to use Podman and containers. Um, just creating this example. So it's nothing fancy, but I think there's a lot of, there's a huge demand of missing how to do that uh, with containers. And um, what might be interesting for you as well is uh, building it, right? So I'm right now I'm working on my Mac uh, since that has uh, inbuilt um, acceleration for these kinds of models. With, with the Apple um, chip and uh, the M1 chip. But if you build on a Mac, I found out that you really also need to tell uh, the, that you will deploy on, on AMD 64 if you want to deploy it on in the Kubernetes cluster. As usually, you don't have Macs there, right? I think this is not needed, but this is something that people new to containers uh, might need to be aware of. And then also creating the, the network that you can talk to different services in, in Putman. Uh, I think you could actually using something like Compose, um, but I have not done that yet. So if anybody here wants to, to do that, feel free to open APR. Um, and then running it is, is super straightforward. Unless, unless you work with tools or software like PyTorch. And I think this is a lot of pain for beginners, and this is something I wanted to, to show. Deploying LLMs or machine learning models, there's a few things you need to know. For example, PyTorch needs shared memory. And if you're not aware of that, um, you might not be aware of this small line. I can make it larger here. Yeah, you need to set the, the shared memory size. So if you ever deployed PyTorch via Podman or, or on Kubernetes, I think this is one of the first things you run into. PyTorch crashes because there's no shared memory. Usually in Kubernetes, you mount an empty 
uh, file with that kind of size to have it as well. So like I said, I think there's still a few pitfalls, which I also wanted to document for, for beginners, as I count myself in there as well. And the other thing is, of course, taking this and, and deploying it uh, to a Kubernetes cluster, which I have also created a YAML file as well. But then again, if you do that and you don't have GPU support, uh, it's going to be slow. So just to switch to my different system, I can show you my screen there. Um, and it works. <laughs> Sharing, you can see my screen, right, Tom? Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so on the fly, yes. I, this is not my, I think yeah, this is not my Fedora system. Uh, where I actually do have an NVIDIA graphic card. And I think one thing that I want to, to give back to the community is when I when I researched how to deploy a LLM or any kind of pro, um, software that, that needs a GPU, this is still a big pain, especially for beginners, as you find a lot of how-tos and tutorials out there, but most of them are outdated. So what I can tell you, the, the easiest thing uh, that you can do is um, to use the uh, NVIDIA uh, CDI uh, tool and, and not doing it with any hooks. And then you can actually straight forward uh, just deploy your container using, of course, forwarding the port you will later on use on your local machine or somewhere else, and then using device NVIDIA.com GPU or, or the, the, the GPU. And one important thing is, of course, you need to disable a bit of security in order to do that. So this is also something that you really need to find out and and, and dig a bit deeper to find the security op label disable that you get uh, the most commonly frameworks and everything to to run using Podman. If I do that, I can easily have deployed it on my local machine. So I downloaded the Llama container, which was built for Docker. But it runs quite well in uh, in Podman as well using this command line, and then I can easily query it. So I can pull I can pull the needed model if you don't have that, and I can look at my cheat sheet. Oh. So this is also on GitHub um, where I documented some of the commands needed like creating the network or checking that you have DNS configured and everything uh, in the network to, to work with these kinds of containers. So one thing that I hope I, I can get like out of this, like also presenting here to, to make it easier for, for beginners to, to use such kind of software. Uh, and as you can see here, this is the streaming API of Olama serving a large language model um, and answering or completing the text for the for the question, why is the sky blue, uh, which is one of the default things uh, that uh, Olama uses for testing. Pretty nice and pretty fast, thanks to GPU support. Um, and later on, if you need uh, uh, more complicated stuff, I think if you have mastered deploying models for inference, you will soon find out that these are not finished so you will need to fine tune them and fine tuning them is a whole lot of other problem and i actually found out um, using containers makes it much more easy so going back to my mac i can i can share a few things there um, if you're interested why why does it make it easier um, as you might know um, there are packages for, for AMD, for Rockam, and for Doro now, so that's very easy to run on a Linux machine. But unfortunately, NVIDIA, the, the CUDA libraries are still proprietary. So the most easiest thing is to use a ready-made container, which includes all of it. And you will see that most of them, they use a certain operating system, because it's also built in the way uh, NVIDIA builds it. Um, so we go back to my uh, cheat sheet. Yeah, yeah. I have not prepared any slides or anything after Easter vacation. I apologize, but I hope you can learn, still learn 
something from this. Um, where's my cheat sheet? Um, I put it on, <coughs> yeah, I put it on uh, on GitHub as well. If you need to use fine tuning software, there's something called Axolotl, and that's an easy framework to get started. But in order to do that, you also need to know how to use it with Podman. Um, again, using the the right device, the right security settings, mount your, your local directory that you can actually use the configurations available, mount a volume for the hacking phase cache where model are downloaded, and then use the right container. And these usually use uh, some kind of uh, NVIDIA supported Ubuntu operating system. But using this is actually the only way I got the certain software you need for fine tuning and running these models faster. Um, because setting these up in your local directory without a container is really a big mess and usually mess up your, your virtual ends. So I can only recommend using containers to do that. And fortunately, a few colleagues of mine, they have picked it up. So just to show you why this is so complicated, I want to um, feature a bit of work done by uh, my colleague, uh, Christian Heims. <clears throat> he has created a container for, for one of his projects. And you can see um, he's using Fedora Toolbox. That's something I, I, I really uh, learned to, to love, as it actually makes it quite easy. And if you look at the container file, <laughs> you can imagine why this is a pain to set up locally because you need so many different tools and then some of this is not packaged. You need to copy some header files. Um, you need to download the right version supported, for example, for this is for AMD graphic cards. You need to download the right versions uh, for the rebuild and this kind of stuff. I think this really showed me why we have containers and why this is a good choice for, for using these kind of containers for machine learning. Um, because I know I have spent a lot of time to make this happening on a local machine without containers, but using containers in something like Toolbox is really a godsend gift, in my opinion. This was basically the gist of it. So if you're interested in, in deploying it to Kubernetes, uh, it's also in my repository also how you can do this um, with GPU support. It's actually not much more complicated. Um, there's a pre-made container image, and then you just need to request some CPU memory, and for example, in NVIDIA graphic cards. And my packages are on, on GitHub and also on Quay. Um, oh. <laughs> not anymore, apparently. Yeah. That's not, doesn't look good. I wonder if Quay's having problems. It does? Okay. Yeah. Well, there's, there's one, there's a container here. <laughs> well, it's quite old, but yeah. Um, I think there's a huge, I think what, what, what I would like, the last thing I want to, or to give back to the community is I think we need to document this more and document more example how, especially beginners, can get started. And I hope the, the amount of time and, and things I found out we can share with the community as well. So if you have any questions further than that, please feel free to, to ask me. Yeah, I do have a quick question, um, Stefan, if you could share the link for your GitHub so oh, I can actually do it yeah. more, um, so people can go ahead and dive in once they get to that and I'll put it, yeah. I can keep it on uh, YouTube as well. That's a good, yeah. Yeah, and one, one thing I which I wanted to add, so this was, I think the, the network thing is not working. I tried to test it for our meeting, but I couldn't get it to uh, to really work with the network. I think that's the last minute change I added like a few months ago. But yeah, in, in theory it works. And on, on actually I have to say on Kubernetes, it's uh, especially on OpenShift, <laughs> it's much more easier to set these things up with a uh, GPU operator than doing these things locally. So yeah, I still think using containers is, is good for, for this kind of work and people should use it more. So great. Oh, thank you for the link. I see that there. So does anybody have any questions for Stefan?
Hey, I am not hearing any. Then I will thank you, Stefan. It was a really nice presentation and chat. And uh, be interested to see how this grows over time. I'm sure it will. Nolan, we have you up next talking about Podman Manifest and the support for artifacts. Okay, just a second while I get my screen sharing going. All right, um, I'm here to show you. Okay, there we go. I'm here to discuss Podman Manifest and OCI artifact support. Um, by way of background, most of you are probably familiar at this point with using manifest lists, uh, the Docker format, or the related OCI image index, which is more or less the same thing, to distribute multiple versions of a container image that have been built for different architectures. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do with Podman 5.0, and Brent could probably speak to this better than I do, is distribute the disk images that Podman Machine uses. Uh, in the same place in, at the very same time as the container images that were used to generate them. And thankfully, OCI 1.1 adds a notion called artifacts, which lets us embed non uh, items that are not container images in image indexes and distribute them through registries the exact same way. So we wanted to add some, so one of the things we did for Podman 5 and the associated version of Builda is add the ability to do that. So I'm just going to give a quick rundown of the differences between the two. Uh, first, Thankfully, command line history remembers some of this stuff for me. We'll look at the container image for BusyBox, for example. Um, in particular, you see that it has a media type, which says this is an OCI image manifest. Um, it has a config blob, which is just a regular config blob. It's 372 bytes of JSON. We're not going to look at that. It contains things like environment variables, the name of the command to launch by default, pretty straightforward stuff. It contains well, in this case, just the one layer, but each layer also has its own media type that tells you what it is. In this case, this one tells you it's essentially a GZIP tarball, which is fine. Uh, we're not going to look at that one either. <laughs> OCI images also have things like artifacts, sorry, annotations attached to them to tell you additional information, depending on who built it and what other information they wanted to provide. Uh, in contrast to that, an artifact manifest looks very similar because I think the intent is to make it fairly easy for registries that are already out there to add support for our artifacts, which is essentially just relaxing the set of restrictions they place on things that you push them. So let me inspect one that I've already got up there in the cloud, which is uh, this one. You'll see that frequently you add something like an artifact type field, which in addition to saying this is an OCI image manifest index, tells you what sort of artifact it is. And this value here is just the default would be picked up from Moraz, which is uh, we didn't actually know because nobody told us, but we have to put something in here anyway. So that's fine. The config blob is actually just an empty config blob. If you, we actually embed the data for that config blob here. If you uh, unbase 64 decrypt this, this is just a pair of curly braces. It's two bytes. And here is the interesting thing. The layers, in air quotes, are actually the files to be attached. In this case, this is one I generated from the Etsy services file on my machine. It's 700K. Um, we added an annotation to the layer that says, oh, you might want to name the services instead of that big SHA sum if you're going to store it in a file. But other than that, it looks pretty straightforward. You can slot this into an image index the same way that you would a container image, and then you can push it to a registry. So now I'll demonstrate that. Uh, Podman. Create a manifest and Podman manifest. Help. We can see that it now has a number of additional options for artifacts. The main one that you want to use is dash dash artifact. It'll guess about the rest if you don't, but you know. So we're going to skip a bunch of these and let's see. Oh, man. Man. Am I talking right? Nope. The your sharing window is uh, covering directly over the part where I'm typing, so I can't actually see what I'm doing. I have to look at this. Nope. Nope. The name of the manifest list, sorry, image index we're adding it to. And this time, let's use the Etsy protocol file. We inspect it, we get a little bit more information than we used to. In particular, we keep track of the fact that there's an artifact in here now, and this is the file that we're using for it. Under the covers, Podman actually just kept a symbol to this file. So if you change it out from under it, things are going to go wrong at push time because the digest will no longer match. So uh, don't do that if you add things. If you're running Podman remote, we actually have to upload a copy of the file. So that's okay, but it takes up a little bit more disk space. So in any, in any case, uh, Podman manifest push. Today's date, April 2nd. And hopefully, quit.io is 
Yeah, there we go. No, sorry. We can go ahead and inspect that list and put that to the queue. We can see that we have a regular image index. We keep track of the image, uh, sorry, of the artifact type when we add one to an image index now. And then we can actually just clarify that artifact, sorry, query. Clarify is not a word. We can query that manifest directly and take a look at what we've got now. Make it more legible. And you, as again, you can see, we this is pretty much boilerplate every single time, but now we've uploaded the contents of our protocols file, which is only 6K. And in a Podman machine image index, you're going to see um, entries for multiple artifacts, and you're going to see artifacts for uh, different architectures, different hypervisors, and those will also include the container images that were used to generate them, which I think is pretty slick, and it makes sure that when you're looking at it in the registry, we're always looking at versions that are synchronized with each other, and they can't fall out of sync unless um, something really horrible has happened. And that's the entirety of the demo, and hopefully enough of a background that everyone knows what's going on. Those of you who might be wondering, hey, can I create an image artifact for something and not put it in an image index? That's not there yet. We didn't need it, but it's coming. And that's the end of the demo. Now, if there are any questions, I'm going to stop sharing so I can see them on my screen. Unless there's something people want to take a look at before I stop doing that. I'm not seeing any. Yep, yeah, go ahead. Yep, yeah, go ahead. Oh, that's me going ahead and stop sharing. Got it. Not to go ahead and ask the question, whoever did that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think I was also playing, hearing an echo. I thought it was somebody else's okay. question in, in front of me. All right. Um, so, are there any other questions for Nolan? Oh, I should add that this is yeah, this is something we actually completed a, a, about a month ago, maybe maybe two months. So it's in the current version of Podman, and it's sorry, it's in the current version of Podman five and build a was it one dot thirty three that worked you now? One dot thirty five, possibly one thirty four, probably one thirty five though. So if you're using it, I um, would love to hear if you're running into problems or places where we can make the command line interface friendlier or more helpful. Right now, we have a lot of these things filled in by defaults. If there are other things we could do to improve the user experience for this, I would love to uh, get some feedback on that. All right. All right. Thanks. That looks great. Great. Sure. And with that, we have um, we have um, oh, one update. Oh, one okay, this is less of five of one update since we've already shipped it and more just a general release plan for the future. So we shipped 5.0, I, I want to say three weeks ago now, two or three weeks. And now we're starting to focus on stability releases for 5.0. There were a number of problems with the release, which is to be expected. It was a major release. And we're trying to get those fixed as we find them. 5.01 was out yesterday that had most of the fixes for big things we've identified. Uh, still a few open large issues, but we're trying to get those sorted, especially once around Pasta, uh, the new rootless network default. Uh, Let's see. So I'm expecting we will have probably a 502, maybe a 503. So some additional stability patches coming out over the next couple of weeks. For our next minor release, I would expect a Podman 5.1 sometime in the May time frame, uh, probably the second half of May. And that is going to be a much smaller release than 5.0, obviously. Don't really have any specific features planned. This is more of a let's get a release out at some point early summer. And then probably a 5.2 at some point in the later summer time frame, maybe a July, August time frame. So yeah, I think that's basically our schedule for the rest of summer. Just trying to catch up the notes here. Are there any questions about that or comments?
Great, I'm not hearing anything, so thanks for that, Matt. And given that, we are out of plan topics for today. And are there any open questions or topics that somebody else want to bring up? Okay, while we're thinking about that, I'll just remind everybody that the next community meeting will be on Tuesday, June 4th, 11 a.m. again, Eastern Time. Um, that'll be UTC 5, um, like what it says in the notes at the moment. And the next Cabal meeting will be coming up in two weeks from today on the 16th. And I am always looking for topics for either or both of those. And again, the Cabal meeting is generally more of a design type of meeting, things that you'd like to see added in the future, whereas this meeting, the community meeting, is more of a demo type of meeting. So any questions, comments? Let me see something in the chat. Um, I think Rahil was making a note towards Stefan about um, adding a way to edit a container from Cube Play YAML, maybe add an annotation for that. Yeah, feel free to, to open a, a PR. <laughs> I'm always looking at our contributions. I haven't touched it in a, in a few months, so yeah, I'm happy for any any hint or recommendation. And as I said, I, I was a Podman noob before that. I still am. So. Yeah. Great. Anything else for today? One last chance before I turn off the recording. Right. Well, then I will thank the folks who presented today and chatted. It was good talks all around. Thanks, you all, for attending, and we'll see you next time.